Welcome to another snapshot version and we are still in the financial statements audit but this time we are going to talk about client acceptance, assessing the risk of material misstatement which would also include a discussion on the different types of materiality. So in the very beginning the question always is should we accept a new engagement or accept a new client or continue an existing engagement or client, or is it time to move on? When the auditor attempts to answer this question, the auditor looks at four things. Number one, the auditor determines if he is competent to perform the engagement. This is rule number one. Never accept an engagement that you are not competent to perform. So in determining the auditor's competence to perform the engagement, the auditor asks the question, can I perform an audit? And assuming that you have the necessary license and the number of years of experience and are accredited with the Board of Accountancy here in the Philippines, the quick answer to that would, of course, be yes. However, added to that, the auditor must also determine and obtain an understanding of the client's business and industry to ascertain if there is a need to obtain additional or more detailed knowledge after the acceptance of the engagement. The second thing that the auditor will look at is the auditor's independence. Is the auditor able to meet the ethical requirements as put forward by the Code of Ethics? And to this, the auditor must identify the independence threats present should the auditor accept or continue the said engagement. The third item that the auditor looks into is the capability to serve the client. The auditor must therefore check their resources, their time, their manpower, including whether the client is auditable. And by that, we mean, does the client have the necessary records and the necessary internal control system? Lastly, the auditor must determine the prospective client's integrity. And to this, the auditor will look to articles or maybe inquiry and even a discussion with the predecessor or the previous auditor. Should the auditor wish to discuss or should the auditor speak with the should the successor auditor speak with the predecessor auditor, we must be reminded that it can only be done so with the permission of the client. So the successor auditor or the incoming auditor shall first ask permission from the client to talk to the outgoing or the previous or the predecessor auditor. And should the client give this permission, there are three very important things that the successor auditor must ask. Number one, what was the reason for the change in the engagement? Number two, what about the integrity of this client? And number three, what were the disagreements that the predecessor auditor had with the client? So RID, reasons for the change, integrity of the client, and disagreements if there are any. So after determining all of these things, the auditor must then decide, shall the auditor reject or accept the client? If the auditor decides on accepting the client after evaluating these things, then the auditor will proceed to evaluating if the preconditions of the audit are met. To these preconditions, we refer to, number one, whether the client uses an acceptable financial reporting framework. Of course, in the Philippines, that would be our PFRS. The second precondition is that management should agree to the audit premise. The audit premise being that management is the one responsible for the financial statements, internal controls, assessment of going concern, but that also management will provide the auditor unrestricted access to records and people necessary to come up with a satisfactory audit. After that, there will be an agreement of the terms of an engagement and this will of course be documented via what we know of as the engagement letter. So the engagement letter puts forward the terms of the agreement. Now there might be a question as to whether should the auditor send a new engagement letter every year in the case of a recurring client? The quick answer to that is not necessarily. Normally, a new engagement letter will be sent, especially for recurring clients, if there are any indications of misunderstanding or if there has been a change in the people privy to the contract that is, of course, the engagement letter. Meaning to say, should senior members of management change or senior members of the audit team change, then that there is a need to send a new letter. Otherwise, there will be no need. Another question would be, 
In the case of audit of components, in the case, for example, of group financial statements, should a separate engagement letter be sent to each component? When we talk about a component, we're referring to branches, affiliates, subsidiaries. The quick answer to that is it will depend. It will depend on the independence of the management of the component. It will depend on whether laws and regulations require it. So there is no, there is no other quick answer except to say it will depend. Now, what if the client requests for a change in engagement, especially when we're referring to a change from a higher level of assurance to a lower level of assurance. The auditor must then determine, is the reason given justifiable? If the auditor determines the client's reason to be unjustifiable or unreasonable, then the auditor must continue the old, must continue the original engagement. But if the auditor is not allowed to continue with the original engagement, then the auditor should withdraw from the said engagement. However, if the auditor is satisfied as to the reason being given by the client, then the auditor will stop the old and will start the new engagement. And remember, once this is the case, you should not make any reference to the old engagement so that the readers of the report will not be confused. Unless if the new engagement is an agreed upon procedures engagement, because as you very well know, in the case of agreed upon procedures, well, you will have to tell the readers what were the procedures that you performed, okay? But other than that, if you have already agreed to change the engagement, do not make any reference to the old. You must therefore move on. Okay, so that will be for client acceptance. Now we move forward to audit planning, supervision, and monitoring. However, there are a number of activities present in audit planning. We have identifying and assessing the risk of material misstatement. We have establishing overall audit strategy, development of a more detailed audit plan, and finally, direction, supervision, and review. As early as now, we have to be reminded that the establishment of the overall audit strategy as well as the audit plan are the expected outputs of audit planning. And we, remember, we must remember that these have to be documented together with any significant changes made to the overall audit strategy and the overall audit plan. That is simply the requirement given to us by our auditing standards. However, in this snapshot, we will be focusing on identifying and and assessing the risk of material misstatements. And under this, we will have the following activities. First off, of course, is obtaining an understanding of the entity's environment, including internal controls. And for this, we will have to perform our risk assessment procedures, which we know to comprise of the big three, inquire, inspect, observe, and of course, add to that analytical procedures if performed in the planning phase. Now, we also will consider materiality. And we acknowledge that materiality is affected not only by the amount, but including the nature of the misstatement. According to our standards, an item is considered immaterial if it is both trivial and inconsequential. Therefore, telling us that we are not only looking at the quantifiable side, the amount, the balance, the value, but also the qualitative side, meaning to say the nature and the consequences that come with such an item. So therefore, it is immaterial if it is both trivial trivial and inconsequential. Now, in cases of materiality, we're also reminded that materiality is not a discrete phase of the audit. Rather, this is something that must be considered by the auditor both in the planning and later on in the completion phases of the audit. After all, our opinion will say whether the financial statements are free from material misstatements. So even at the completion phase of the audit, we still have to go back and consider materiality. Now, there are three different types of materiality, and you can find this one in the AASC Bulletin Series 001 of 2010. Let's pay it a quick visit so that we will get to know what are the different types of materiality, starting, of course, with overall materiality. This is what we know of as materiality at the FS level, or general materiality, or planning materiality. So the focus here is the smallest aggregate amount of misstatement applicable to all the financial statements. Therefore, when we talk about overall materiality, our mindset, our focus, our emphasis will be on the FS, okay, on the financial statements as a whole. Now, this will help determine whether the proposed adjusting entries are significant or not. And this is ordinarily determined by applying a certain percentage to a benchmark. 
Now, as to what benchmark to use and what percentage to use, this is something that is left to the auditor's judgment. Our auditing standards do not actually prescribe a formula. So most audit firms have their own guidelines as to what particular benchmark to use. Say, for example, one very common guideline for usual commercial establishments, which are profit-oriented, will of course be the net income before tax. But if you th think about an entity that is not profit-oriented, a cost center, for example, a charitable institution, for example, that might not be an appropriate base or benchmark, right? You might look into the fund utilization side or the total expenses, for example, and apply a certain percentage to that. So again, this is where the auditor's judgment would come in. Now, other than overall materiality, we also have performance materiality. Performance materiality is an amount that is less than the overall materiality. The idea of the auditor here is that, well, there might be misstatements, misstatements which I have not yet seen, or there may be misstatements which are individually immaterial, but when lumped together, they might become material. So in order to feel a little more comfortable about the materiality considerations, the auditor will then determine a lower amount to the overall materiality to provide some kind of like a cushion and we call this one performance materiality now performance materiality is simply computed as the overall materiality which we have computed before multiplied by a certain percentage now this certain percentage will reflect the cushion that we have mentioned say for example you will say overall materiality times 75 percent so you have therefore given the overall materiality a 25% haircut. Okay, so this lower level of materiality, once distributed to the accounts in the performance of audit sampling, is what we call tolerable misstatement. Finally, we talk about specific materiality, sometimes called individual materiality. So this is an amount set by the auditor for a particular or specific class of transactions, account balances, or disclosures. Say, for example, the auditor would like to have a special materiality for related party transactions. So therefore, the auditor will come up with a specific materiality for the said transaction, account balance, or classes of events. Ergo, we say that in the case of materiality, there are three types, overall materiality or materiality at the FS level, performance materiality, which is an amount lower than the overall materiality, and which when distributed in the performance of audit sampling is thereby called tolerable misstatement. And then we have specific materiality or a materiality for a specific account only or a specific transaction or a specific event. So that's materiality. And then, of course, we identify and assess the risk of material misstatement, but this was something that we talked about in detail in the previous snapshot. So we just recall at this point that the assessment of the risk of material misstatement is done at both the macro or FS level and the micro or the assertion level. So if you want to go visit our previous snapshot for that, we will find there the more uh, detailed discussion on the assessment of the risk of material misstatement. And finally, we talk about applying this to the audit risk model, which of course will help us determine our responses to the risk of material misstatement via the audit procedures that we will perform, looking into, of course, the nature, timing, and extent. We also talked about this one in detail in the previous snapshot. However, for here, let's invite this table to the screen. So this table is actually a guide as to how to determine the acceptable level of detection risk. It works kind of like a multiplication table where you simply determine what is the inherent risk assessment, assuming, for example, the inherent risk assessment is high, and the control risk assessment, assuming the control risk assessment is medium, that will result to an acceptable level of detection risk that is lower. So that is how this table is going to be used. But there is no need for you actually to memorize the table. What you just need to know and recall are the relationships of these factors to your audit effort. Okay, say, for example, if we talk about the risk of material misstatement, if you look at it directly to audit effort, 
RMM will have a direct relationship to audit effort, meaning to say, the higher the risk of material misstatement, the more audit effort you will have to exert. If you pass through the acceptable level of detection risk path, then we will say, the higher the risk of material misstatement, the lower will be the acceptable level of detection risk. The lower the acceptable level of detection risk, the more you will need to test. So therefore, if what you would like to look at will be the acceptable level of detection risk, then it will have an inverse relationship to your audit effort. And then finally, when we talk about materiality, we also recall that the lower the materiality you are taking or you are using in an audit, the stricter you actually become. Because if you imagine materiality to be a threshold, a low threshold is a signal of a strict auditor. So the lower the materiality, the more audit effort you will have to exert. All right? So that's about it for this snapshot. So I'd like to say once again, good job, everyone. I hope we were able to refresh some of these concepts in your mind. In your minds, I would invite you to head on over to the next snapshot. Or if you have some MCQs in hand, you may want to answer those as well. So thank you for joining me and see you in the next snapshot.